Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well, ready to start on our next project, which is the color preamp designed by Matt. Put his web link below. He's the same guy that designed this universal preamp that can use a variety of different input tubes. And it does a great job of adding some color to a tube amplifier, but most tube amplifiers don't need that. And most tube amplifiers don't need a preamp. So to me, while this was a fun little project, it didn't have a lot of real world use. This one, on the other hand, I think will. This is the color preamp and I want to thank Dan Russell. He donated all of this to the channel for us to enjoy and he made this chassis to build it on already pre-drilled ready to go. Thanks Dan for donating this and I think this is going to be a fun project. The cool thing about the color preamp is it's very similar to this universal preamp but it will only work with a 12 AU7, which is fine because most people don't need a lot of gain in a preamp because they're looking to put something like this between a DAC and a solid state or a Class D amp that maybe sounds too sterile and they're looking to put some life into it or some color. And so, very cool design. Took me a little while to kind of wrap my head around what he was thinking, but after posting a question online on a couple of forums and watching people go crazy trying to redesign this amp into something it was never intended to be, which was a mild distortion preamp that adds some second harmonics to the music. And these guys were like, oh, you need to change the cathode voltage and direct couple this. And here's how you design it where it's super quiet. And you need to move the volume control and make get lower the distortion. It's like, guys, that's not what we're trying to do here. And, and I don't think I could get across to these folks. They were so busy going on their simulators and all that that they never even read why we're building this. So... What I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to attempt to go through the schematic and point out why this is done the way it is and some things that we're going to test as we're building it. And then, you know, obviously at the end of this, we'll wrap it up with some final testing and some listening tests. I've got some friends that have some solid state systems that I can go over and plug this thing into and see what kind of change it makes to the sound and hopefully this thing will rock. I think it's going to. So again, thanks Dan for donating this and doing such an awesome job on this chassis. This thing looks really cool. Got a nice hammer transformer, got a choke, we got tube sockets and everything and yeah, this is going to be a fun project. So let's get to looking at the schematic and going over what this thing is and what it's not. Okay, so let's look over the schematic and I'll try to go over some of the design ideas that Matt used. And I'm sorry, Matt, I can't remember your last name. I'll maybe get it in a future video, but it was at CascadeTubes.com. This is the same guy that designed that little one tube universal preamp. And the one tube universal preamp was fine for driving like a tube amp, but it really doesn't have the low impedance on the output to be able to drive a solid state amp that some of them do have rather low impedance, especially some of the class D ones. So what we're doing here is the input signal comes in here. This is our 510K grid leak resistor which also sets the input impedance for this amp, which is obviously pretty high, being at 510K. And real quick, too, here was Matt's drawing, and I just replicated it in this drawing, so to me it's a little easier to read than drawn out on ruled paper, but it's the same exact same schematic. 
Anyway, we come in through this 5K grid stopper, which honestly seems a little high, and a couple of people question that too when I put this on a forum asking some questions. But I'll get with Matt and see if there's a good reason why it's this high. But anyway, grid stopper, this is something that's super critical, is he's intentionally set the cathode bias fairly high so that if we get a pretty hot signal coming into this amp because there's no attenuation on the front end, that we don't drive or overdrive this front gain triode and create just insane amounts of distortion, which would sound horrible on a hi-fi amplifier. So he's got this set high enough so your normal DAC output, like 2 volts RMS, isn't going to overdrive the two. And this 2.4K resistor sets the bias voltage on the cathode. This 33 UF cap bypasses the AC to ground, which gives this gain tube some boost. One of the things I did on the universal preamp is I put a switch to switch this cap in and out of the circuit. And it does kind of change the tone. It almost acts like a loudness button on some amps have. And so I may end up doing that on this amp too, just to give like kind of a tone option that you can try with and without this capacitor in the circuit to tailor it to your system and what you want it to sound like. Here's where the B plus comes into the circuit. We got our 51K plate load resistor. And then the signal comes off between this plate load resistor and the plate through this 1UF cap that's working against this 1 meg and then 10K in series resistance, which the filtering effect of this, even this small of a cap, isn't going to have any issues with low frequency roll off. And using a smaller cap as possible is always a good idea. So then the signal comes into this cathode follower. And this part of the circuit wasn't in the universal preamp because it was designed for driving tube gear. This is designed for driving lower impedance solid state gear. And that's what these cathode followers are good at. Then we go through this larger capacitor here. There's a 10K potentiometer that then attenuates the signal before it goes to the output. Now this potentiometer on the output is, I'm not going to say odd, but it's very different. There's not many amps that do this. Most of them attenuate the signal on the front end like this one, where you have this 100K pot and it's adjusting the signal before it goes to the front tube. And normally you would do that to try to get as little distortion and have as little of the signal being amplified by this tube, which does reduce the distortion. But that's not the purpose of this color preamp. The purpose of this is to add some second order harmonics between a digital input and a sterile sounding solid state amp that this output's connected to. And the whole purpose of this is to add about 1% distortion, and I think that's what Matt said this thing generates, of second order harmonics that adds some color to the sound. Now, so there's some purists that'll freak out that you're adding some distortion to it. But if you watched my latest amp build, I ended up adding a half a percent of distortion to the amplifier because for whatever reason, it sounded better with the LED on the cathode than it did with the resistor that was adding some negative feedback reducing the distortion. It just didn't have any life to it. And that's what this color preamp is doing. So for it to do its job, if we attenuate the signal on the front end, the amount of distortion that's generated in this gain stage would vary with the volume that you are asking the system to play at. And we don't want that. We want the 
this harmonic distortion that's being generated to remain constant at any volume level that you're playing the system at. And the only way to do that is to attenuate the signal after the gain stage, not before it. And I posted this on a couple of forums, and I don't know if people just have reading comprehension problems or don't understand this or just don't agree with that this would even work, but people lost their minds over putting the volume control on the output. And at first, I didn't really understand it either. That's why I asked the question. And I drew up this schematic thinking, hey, why aren't we doing it like this? And then after some people started talking about why you would do that versus this, then I realized, well, I don't want to put it on the front end because that's ruining what we're trying to do here. And then Matt came in, saw these discussions. He tried to explain it, and I don't think three-quarters of the people still understand what's going on or what we're trying to do here. But that's okay. I hope you guys watching this video understand what we're trying to do here. And even if you maybe don't want this in your system, it's going to be interesting to try this because I've got a friend that has a... I think it's a pile solid state amp that it just doesn't sound great. I mean, he's he's trying to use it working with an active crossover project that he's playing with, but I think something like this color preamp was going to be ideal to put some richness back into the sound. So, anyway, that's basically how this thing is designed. And the other thing that I saw is one guy was saying that, you know, it maybe put a pot like this on the front end and then have one on the back end too where you could adjust how much distortion this thing is generating in your system. This thing's going to be used on a DAC or a streamer probably 90% of the time. Those devices already have an output control. And so if you want lower distortion, you would lower the output of your DAC and then turn up this volume pot on the output. And if you want more distortion or more harmonics, you would turn up the DAC to drive this tube harder and then turn this volume pot down. The other nice thing about this preamp is that a lot of DACs, I feel like, don't sound great when they're at max volume. And they do need a little help with their gain department. Like, the digital analog converter might be really good, but then the op amp that they're using to boost the gain after the conversion isn't the greatest in the world. And so, this preamp could likely help that issue with some of these cheaper DACs by providing higher quality gain after the analog signal is generated and add some second order harmonics at the same time. So I think this is going to be a really cool project. The only thing that I'm questioning and I want to do some testing with is Matt even shows on his website about the low frequency roll off is there. And that may not be an issue if you've got a powered sub and that kind of a thing. But I'm wondering if this one UF cap mixed with this 10K pot plus the resistance of the impedance on the cathode follower plus whatever you're driving might be creating a high pass filter that's a little on the high frequency side and may be harming some of the you know 20 hertz ish frequencies and so i did order a 6.8 uf cap i went ahead and went pretty good bit bigger and it's a mundorf cap so it's a really nice high quality which you would want on a cap that big that we may swap in here when we're doing our 
frequency response pulls and just see what that does to the bottom end, especially at some of the extremes of the ranges on this 10K pot driving a low impedance load. So I've decided just to build it the way Matt designed it. And that's what the parts the guy sent me after reading through several of his pages about, you know, design thought processes on, you know, parts choosing and tuning that he's done on this thing. He's done a lot of work on this thing to get it where it's at. And I think it would be dumb to kind of second guess what he's designed into this thing. So this is how we're going to build it and maybe play with it from there. But I think it's going to work great. So, let's wrap this up here. So, as you can see, pretty ingenious design, I think. And this is not your average preamp. And there's the techie, geeky guys would give this thing two thumbs down. You send this thing to a mirror over at Audio Science Review, and he would trash it talking about what a distortion-making piece of junk it is. But that's kind of the point, guys. And... He'd probably do the same thing with that spud amp that I just built and probably some of my other amps too. You know, you, when you scientifically look at them, they don't make sense. But when you listen to them, that's what matters. And I keep saying that over and over again. Listen with your ears, not with your brain and your eyes. Can't listen with your eyes looking at a simulation. So, anyway... I don't think this is going to be a real long build series, at least I hope not. And obviously, I can't show y'all like the chassis fabrication because Dan fabricated it all up. It's ready to go. He even put like a divider inside to separate the power supply from the signal part of it. I think I may have a, some MU metal I might stick in here between it too, but we'll get into that when we're building this thing. The other thing that I want to play with and test, we'll show this on the channel too, is what changing the size of the output coupling capacitor does. And we're not going to like do, you know, five or ten different ones. We're going to try the one UF one, do a frequency response pull, and then put a 6.8 UF one in it and do the same thing and see how that affects the low frequency response. It may not change anything, but we'll find out when we're testing it because that's what we do here at Skunky Designs. We test everything. So anyway, hope you're enjoying this content. Hope you're enjoying this channel. I think this is going to be a fun project for you guys to build. I'm definitely going to you know, keep links to Matt's website and his articles down here below. He's got some great reading about the volume controls and why they're on the back end. I tried to explain it the best I could, but you might want to read his, you know, reasoning behind it too. And I think this is a cool learning experience for all of us. So again, if you're enjoying this content, please subscribe. I'm trying to get to 10K subs. We're creep past 7K and we kind of slowed down. I want to get to 10K subs. I think that'd be a good spot for the channel. So sub, like the video. Thank you, Patreon folks. Thanks for people that donated to the website, and thanks to folks like Dan who donated this whole kit to the channel. Doesn't even want it back. He's just like, here, build this because I think people enjoy watching it. So thanks again, Dan, and until next time, have a nice day.